Hi, I'm Michael Killen. Parents, teachers, policy makers often wonder how important is art in the education of children, adults, and so on. And everyone says art is important, but when we ask them what does it really do for the mind or the human being, we usually do not get any answers. On this TV program, I am interviewing uh, the pioneer in developing many of the concepts that help us understand what impact art has on children's minds and on adults' minds. My guest is Elliot Eisner. He's uh, a Stanford professor emeritus, emeritus and he's also uh, the winner of, uh, of an award that is in the field of education roughly equivalent to receiving a Pulitzer Prize. Elliot, how are you tonight? Wonderful. First of all, thank you for coming on the program. And you heard my little introduction of you and the little setup for this program. And would you modify it at all? Or? I'd invite you to say more. You, <laughs> you are so kind. And in fact, I'm flattered. And I want to say what brought me to you. It is this book. The Arts and the Creation of Mind. Yes. And, you know, the world is full of books. And not every book appeals to me. This book appealed to me because it gave me some insights to enable the, me to more effectively appreciate what the study of art does for our minds, and I'm very in interested in the developing of my mind and my children's minds, etc. Um, what, what's the most important thing? Well, the most important thing, I suspect, if you try to reduce it to some kind of essential idea, is that the mind is growable, that we create minds, we don't just have them, that mind is a function of how we use our brains. Brains are biological, but minds are cultural. And the mind grows, is fostered in its growth by the conditions it encounters during the course of its life. So I would say the idea of creation of mind, the arts and the creation of mind, that we have a hand in shaping our mental capacities. And uh, what education is about, in large measure, is providing the conditions for that growth to take place. Well, are you saying that if I went to Stanford and if I studied physics, mathematics, some social s studies, some history, et cetera, that that would not be enough for preparing my mind, not just to be, to have a, a rich, fulfilled life, but for seeing things and being more productive and, and successful in my work? Well, we have to talk about what kind of experience we would like to have and what kind of experience can we have in the course of our lives. If I were interested, or if you were interested, in learning to see the world from an aesthetic perspective with respect to color and line and shape and texture and image and expressivity, physics probably would not be the source I would go to. I would go to the arts, I would go to novels, I would go to poetry, etc. So if you take a look at the culture, the culture is populated by a variety of symbol systems, or as I call them, forms of representation. Forms of representation. These are the forms we employ to transform the contents of our consciousness into some public image which is shareable. And uh, what students learn in school, hopefully, is how to decode, how to experience the content that those images make possible. And it all starts with a consideration that is often thought of as being remote from mind, and that is the senses. The senses are basically information pickup systems that allow us to experience the qualitative world that we inhabit. 
and the process of maturation is a process of learning how to read that symbol system those symbol systems I should say because they're multiple and to the extent to which we can do that we can see the world differently we can see the world as a form we can see the world as a piece of history we can see the world as a quantifiable entity etc etc so what I'm interested in doing is making sure that when we provide programs for children in school and adults and teenagers for that matter uh, that they have access to opportunities to learn to use those symbol systems in the process their sensibilities get refined they begun they become increasingly more differentiated their perception becomes differentiated they they see more and more they experience more and more and that's an enhancement of life it's an enrichment all right is this a problem that let's say teachers and maybe parents face um, they a parent for example who has had a traditional education let's say void of art okay uh, sees the world and functions in the world a certain way and they can't see maybe another part of what this world consists of because they haven't been exposed to it to the carpenter the world is made of wood that's the point I think you're trying to make yes that we come to see the world within constraints and uh, D diversifying those constraints is an important way to enrich your life. So, carrying on with this, you know, some people will go into a museum and look at one of the great paintings of, of all time, and I'll, I'll just say like Picasso's Guernica, and they'll look at it. Some people will just see a bunch of lines and a bunch of shapes. Others who may here and gone follow the path that you encourage have had a a broad their education is broader including the arts they see much more would I be correct in saying that well they bring much more to it and you only take from it what you bring to it so that if you were interested you mentioned Guernica if somebody knows something about the history of Guernica the Basque town which was dive bombed by the Nazis in the 1930s they bring a lot more to the perception of that painting than someone who sees it only as a painting and which which has been decontextualized yes so you enrich a person's background and they can see connections and form forms of understanding that might otherwise be lost take for example uh, Franz Hall, the Dutch painter, 17th century. Uh, you have to understand that Holland was a trade country. They had a lot to do with merchandising and objects that were going to be passed on to other countries. And there was the development of the guilds and the establishment of commerce. All of that enhances one's understanding and experience with a painting by Franz Hals or by Rembrandt or by any other Dutch artist of the period. So yes, uh, if you want to diversify your understanding, you need to bring more and more to it. You see the connections that way. You see the connections between one development and another. All right. I think a lot of people when they think about art education they take another step and, and they go well it's fine if it enriches my child's life but that's pretty soft stuff in a way but so they go to the next step and they think about the child getting into good schools they think about the child becoming a productive employee manager or whatever and they don't see the connection between art education and some final 
functionality, you know, a really high performance child, young adult. Can you relate what art education does to building the brain so that it can be used well, make money, innovate, etc. Let's talk about uh, the kinds of cognitive processes that are stimulated and developed and refined through the arts. Take the business of what I call somatic knowledge, where a person has to make some judgments in making a drawing or a painting as to what colors or what forms is he or she going to make in this painting and will it work? Now, will it work is a slippery notion because unlike so many things that are taught in school, the arts don't have single, simple answers to problems or questions. So the person has to make a judgment in the absence of rule. If you have a teacher teaching spelling at the elementary school level, the last thing that the teacher wants is creative spellers. The teacher wants students to converge upon the correct way to spell the word, and they need to do that. It's, it's, it's not a sin. They need to do that in order for the communication to take place. But when you develop a culture of schooling in which right answerism is salient, you develop people who are hooked on fealty to rule rather than on possibility of the imagination taking over. So there are lots of things that the arts confer, multiple answers, multiple solutions to problems is another one. Uh, somatic knowledge is another one. There are many, many more. All right. I'm going to pick up on one of them, and I'm going to try to paraphrase you. In a lot of courses that are taught, elementary school, high school, colleges, the subjects require coming up with the right answer. Mm -hmm. you know, the spelling, the grammar, and, uh, and, and other, you know, solving a calculation, uh, an equation, whatever. But in the real world, you know, in our lives, uh, there's many situations where there is no right answer. Right. It's unknowable. So now, you talked about painting, and I know you were a painter, and you brought up the challenge of making a painting. I mean, there are, so, there are no rules, per se, and you have to select colors, shapes, a composition, and there is, it's not... And you need to make judgments about their relationships. Yes, and that process of making those judgments uh, is exercising the brain. Yes, of course. And maybe empathy comes in, too, because you, you might be thinking about the world looking at this painting, or you might be just thinking about it yourself. I don't know if that's empathy. But so, so this is an example of building the brain through the art in a different way than one normally builds a brain in, in the more so-called rigorous. Is that? Yeah. Uh, the educational problem is to be able to teach in a way so that, I'll speak metaphorically, the mind is stretched regardless of the subject matter that one works on. Good curriculum development in mathematics will provide students with an opportunity to function imaginatively. It won't give them an opportunity to have sensuous experience with visual qualities, but it will give them an opportunity to think imaginatively within the qualities that they work with. Well, when I say qualities, I mean color, line, form, redness, hotness things that we use words to describe, but which they never really describe adequately. Now, you use the word imagination, and as, when I read your book, uh, 
you made reference to art education, and correct me if I'm wrong, helps foster imagination. Yes, and if, 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 if it's handled right in the classroom. And to a society, how important is it that the people have a good imagination? Well, the obvious answer is the obvious answer. Uh, no imagination, no development, no development, no progress, no progress. You have a dying culture. So uh, the people that we saw on television this afternoon trying to fix our economic problems are using their imagination, not necessarily successfully, but they're trying to come up with a solution to a very difficult problem. And they're to be commended for doing that. Now, I have a little formal education, and I can't remember much of it fostering my imagination. Okay? Yes. And what you're saying, I think, is in the, the world of art education, there is this opportunity to really develop the imagination and capabilities, and that, that's a quality we all need as... Yeah, I'm uh, saying more than that. I'm saying right. not only is art education a major source for the development of the imaginative life, but virtually every other subject matter can be taught in a way that stimulates the imagination. And what one wants ideally is an educational program in which the processes of the imagination are part and parcel of the way the game is played. All right, so taking some of the qualities that are the base, part of the basis of art education, you, you believe that they, those qualities should be extended across the teaching of all types of studies. That's right. So that we don't get just the right answers to things, but we, we develop the brain more fully than that's, otherwise. That's right. And I'm also suggesting that when youngsters are engaged in a science project, in a writing project, that the teacher try to provide conditions in which their experience with the task is itself aesthetic. Now, to have an aesthetic experience is to have the opposite of an anesthetic experience. An anesthetic experience is an experience in which there is no feeling, like an anesthesia. An aesthetic experience is an experience in which feeling is generated. And what we want, ideally, this is not so easy to accomplish, but it's an aspiration we should try to achieve. Yeah. I just want to bring it to the, to the business world. You know, Apple Computer mm -hmm. has their stores, and I believe they work hard so that when you and I walk in that store, we feel something. Yes. We feel good. We feel excited. And uh, the Ritz-Carlton is another place that works on creating an environment where people feel something. You know. And that, when they feel something, I never linked uh, aesthetic so clearly to feeling a as you just did. I, I would like to go back to this book for a moment. So you won a award for $200,000 for writing this book. True. And I think that's wonderful. because I can estimate how much you got from the publisher for writing the book, and then you get a, another $200,000, which is you know, like getting the Pulitzer Prize. It's, it's so wonderful. And just restate what people really get out of this book. I would hope that people who read this book get the idea that the arts are primary resources for the development of mind, and that school programs in particular, but life in general, can use the arts not only to have experience which is satisfying aesthetically, but which 
develops deep and complex forms of thinking. That's what I hope they get out of it. Okay. And now, sometimes I play businessman, and I got something out of this that helped me in my business activities. I had to produce a what's corporate video, and uh, some of your concepts allowed me to uh, really make what I think succeed beyond uh, what I might have normally. So it's a very good book. Now, you're working on your 17th book? Yes. 17th. Wow. And I did hear uh, in our discussion just now where you, you sort of chatted about some ideas that I th think you're covering in the book, but maybe you could say what you're trying to do with this new book. Well, we're trying to do a little bit of what I just got through talking about, only applied to research methodology. We like to think about research as an enterprise that can be pursued productively by the arts or by the aesthetic treatment of language or form so that if you're going to be trying to understand, let's say, a small community, the resources that you need to have are not only resources that pertain to how that community feels, but also how you transform those feelings about that community into an image that can be shared with others. So we're trying to change the whole picture of the role of the arts in the context of research, which is a fairly iconoclastic idea. Yes, but I, I need a little help here. When you say research, are, are you using that can I apply that term, let's say, research in the area of physics, in the aerospace, in the area of medicine, biotechnology? Is, is that what you mean by research? Any, any those, discipline? Those people are doing research who work within that discipline, trying to pursue knowledge. Those are species of research. All right. And what I'm saying is that there is a concept of research as an umbrella concept. It's a broad concept. And there are varieties of research. There's historical research, philosophical research. There's arts-based research. And that's what we're working on, okay. arts-based research. How do you frame an inquiry so that what you get out of it has something to do with what the arts make visible, make possible, make empathetically experiential? That's what we're trying to do. Arts. So, well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's, uh, as I said, rather iconoclastic. But one of the nice things about tenure, one of the nicest things <laughs> about being an emeritus, you can do it whatever you want. So this new book, what's what? You have a title yet? Right now, the working title is arts-based research. Okay. So if I'm a researcher in any species or any field of research, I have already a sense of what is involved in my profession of researching. Okay. You're saying your book adds a new element that I could consider to be a more effective researcher, to develop a greater view of whatever I'm looking That's at. That's well put. I couldn't have done better myself. You it's, are so nice. <laughs> it's to provide a broader, more diversified view. It's not to exclude traditional methodologies. It is to provide more diversity in your methodological pantry. And not just to have diversity, but the diversity is related to what you get access to, what you get access to. So that fiction, now this will sound strange, fiction can be used as a research tool. There was an American author who was being interviewed and he was talking about literature and fiction in particular. And the interviewer said, would you tell the audience, which is vast for your interview, what a work of fiction has to have in order to be great? And he said, oh, yes, I can do that. For a work of fiction to be great, 
It has to be true. It has to be true to the readers. They have and to. It has to be true. Yeah. So the, the idea that fiction and truth are separate doesn't work with him. And he's right, I believe. Okay. All right. I'm going to, I like that. I think I'm going to watch the video, you know, when, and think about that some more. We don't have much time, and I've left, and since you live in Stanford, which is pretty much the Palo Alto community. Yeah. Right, um, we have the Palo Alto Arts Center. Does that, what value does that organization provide the community? How do you see it? Wonderful access to studio classes, to children's events. Uh, the Palo Alto Unified School District has an annual art show, which is quite extensive. Uh, it displays, the uh, Palo Alto Art Center displays uh, works by prominent artists, just uh, uh, so it, it's, a, it's a rich resource for the community to use to engage in the arts, both practically or physically, and also to come to appreciate what other people have done in the arts. And I think it's a wonderful Good. resource. Can I ask, what does it do for the children? their minds. Well, everything that we talked about. Okay. You and know, it, it, everything that I said this evening is predicated on the assumption that the arts are well taught. If the arts are not well taught, the contributions are diminished, obviously. Right. I'm going to take us to another point. This is my last question. You used to paint. How come you don't paint any longer? Because I discovered that a more congenial medium for me was the written word. And I discovered that discovery when I was working on my master's degree at the University of Chicago and then later my doctoral work. All right. So I was more of an artist with language than I was with color. All right. I was going to ask you some questions about your speaking at the Aspern Institute, but the time is up. Hi, I'm Michael Killen. My guest is Elliot Eisner. He's a pioneer in the development of art education and the creation of mind.